live stream. Um, so yeah, that's that's one thing. The other thing is that um, I'm taking a lot of the concepts for the book and uh, a lot of stuff from things I've already created uh, for my classroom, for how do you know, for um, various, act I mean, I don't know how many different activities I've developed for astronomy over the years, hundreds. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so it's more like pick these and put them into a format that works. And uh, we'll see how it goes. We have to see whether or not they like it for a starter. Yeah. Uh, well, Cameron Gillis is the first one on this. Hey, this Cameron, afternoon. welcome. That's right. Cameron says, hope you, Scott, and hope you, Scott, and Dr. Barth had a great weekend. Indeed. Yeah, we did. And Mike Wiesner says, hi from soggy Arizona, raining hard right now. Wow. That's got to be unusual for this time of year. Or no, it's not. They get the monsoon thing coming up. Monsoon, yeah. Uh, I remember my dad used to live in uh, Albuquerque and he used to talk about the monsoon rains coming up from the Gulf of California. Yeah. Oh, golly. Hmm. We're getting thumbs up signs. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Let's see. Trying to figure out how to uh, how to see the. Uh, No, it only wants to give me full screen. Doesn't matter. Uh, just trying to figure out how to see the comments as they scroll, but it's probably not a good idea anyway, because then I'm trying to read comments and think <laughs> what I want to say. So I we like the comments, though. I do. I really love them. Yeah, I, Billy I, Beckett says hello from cloudy Texas. Billy, we were just in Texas uh, scouting out a eclipse site. Um, <laughs> Uh, just uh, west of uh, San Antonio. So we had, it started off being really cloudy on Saturday during the day, and then it cleared off Saturday night. So we did finally get a full clear sky. Um, and uh, even with a quarter phase moon, it's dark out there. It is. Dark, dark. Harold Box is glad we have a show today. <laughs> Thanks, Harold. 
this is the story of a mission that unveils an age-old mystery, the mystery of a billion suns, the mystery of our home galaxy. A new space mission is setting off in quest of the origins of our Milky Way in search of the third dimension. It is the story of men doing their utmost to measure the distance to the stars, to faraway suns, nebulas and galaxies, to understand how our world has formed. What's the point with old myths and sagas, with the star maps of our forefathers? How has the Milky Way been formed and where will it go? Join Chats, this fantastic stars, discovery. Come Sharma. with us on our journey From to England? a billion suns. Great. Billy's Astro, for the eclipse, you should look at the national sea seashore. I think we got a good spot, though. Well, uh, hello everybody. This is Scott Roberts from Explore Scientific and the Explore Alliance. And this is the 18th episode of How Do You Know with Dr. Daniel Barth. And uh, uh, Daniel has shown us everything about, um, you know, how to calculate the, you know, circumference of the earth to, uh, you know, how to, um, uh, know that the uh, that the moon is round to you know all these things that we would we just kind of take for granted because we read it somewhere or we heard it somewhere or something like that. He shows us how to actually do it, okay, and uh, and and do it you know without spending a lot of money, you know. So uh, which is which is totally cool. The models and the uh, uh, the experiments that he shows how shows us how to do are made of things that you can find largely around the home. And um, so, uh, but uh, it's really meant to get this muscle up here working. And, uh, uh, you know, so we're really lucky to have Daniel. Uh, he's a gifted teacher, loved by his students. And uh, 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 well, maybe not some students, <laughs> but uh, by many, by, by the ones who get him, you know, for sure. Uh, he's written books. He wrote a book about uh, astronomy, astronomy for educators, which is a free download. If you go to the link in this post, it'll take you to all the episodes, all 18 episodes that we've done so far, where you can download the study guides individually. Uh, if you want to go to Astronomy for Educators and download the whole book, it's right there. So um, anyways, Daniel, thanks for joining us again on your uh, regular Monday program. So thanks, Scott. And uh, welcome everybody. And uh, we were talking before the show, and want to let you know I don't watch the comments during the show because I get distracted. And I I would be like somebody reading from a telephone. Yeah, and it's all it's delayed a little bit too. So it's delayed a little bit, and it would look really strange. So right. Uh, but I love the the questions and the comments. And Scott and I I read all of them after the show, and uh, I love answering the questions at the end that you folks send in. So by all means, keep those coming because we love them. And I love the preview that you gave us today, Scott, with the, the ESA and the Gaia spacecraft. And I love that announcer's cultured British voice. Oh, I, yes. I love to be able to talk <laughs> like that. That's a million dollar voice. But yeah. I have to say, I really fundamentally disagree with one thing that they said there. What good are the maps and legends of our forefathers and you know, for the ESA, for NASA, for Roscosmos, JAXA, that guy's right on the money. We don't want to go by the star catalog of Ulag Beg from Baghdad from 565 AD. We, we don't want to, we want to move beyond that. And I understand the goal of Gaia completely. On the other hand, for those of us who are into astronomy as a hobby, for those of us who are beginning our journey, there is a point. We go back a lot in this show and we talk about what's been done historically and what people did and what they thought and how these ideas have changed. I think understanding our place in history is important. We can't neglect it. We can't erase it. 
We have to embrace it. We have to understand where we've been. And for us as budding new astronomers and even experienced astronomers, the idea of going back and recreating some of these activities leads us to a deeper understanding. I'm uh, Scott, I'm happy to tell our audience I'm starting on a new book uh, and uh, called Star Mentor. Great. Working title. And the idea behind this, this book, partly the show, but in part, and Scott, you know this, and many of our uh, viewers know this, a telescope is like a party in a box. You take your telescope, you go somewhere, yeah. and unless you're like in a back garden with high walls, if you go somewhere, a parking lot, a street corner, and you set it, you set your telescope up, you point at the moon, and you sit down, you've got your little stool there, and you're taking a look at the moon, if there's anybody around, it will, it will be moments before people start coming up to you. Be, then there are assumptions yep. made here. Oh, look, that guy, that guy has a telescope. He must know stuff. And people come up to you and they have questions and they assume you have the answers. And some people just hate this. Leave me alone. I just want to be out somewhere in the dark with my telescope, contemplative, meditative time. But many of us really enjoy it. We enjoy oh, yeah. it when people, I know I do. Me too. I love it when I set up a telescope and people come up, oh, can I have a go? Are, we, are, are you looking at the moon? Where do I look in? How does the light get to my eye? And the questions just start coming. As a teacher, I never have this kind of enthusiastic, all-in response from the audience in the classroom. And there's a, there's a, there's a difference between uh, I got I got put in this class and seeing somebody doing something and I have to go ask a question. I have to go. But for the person with the telescope, it comes down to how do you answer those questions? And that's what the book is going to be all about. How do you help other people learn about astronomy? How do you help people engage? And, uh, you know, you're not going to go to know everything people ask. How do you handle that with, with grace and a plum? So today, what we're going to do is we're going to recapitulate something very, very ancient. We're going to learn about making star maps. And um, the interesting thing is I like to have people engage in sketching. I still do this. I started doing this with my first astronomy class back in the 80s. I still do this today. And I get... Many of the, I, when people come up to me in a telescope, I hand them a clipboard with some paper on it and a pencil and I, ooh, try to draw the Big Dipper. Try to draw what you see of the moon. And people demure, I can't do that. I'm not an artist. I'm not a scientist. Well, you know what? When you come up to someone who has a telescope and go, ooh, can I ask you a question? Guess what? You're a scientist you've come up with a sense of curiosity and wonder, and you've asked a question about the universe and you've engaged a colleague in your search for knowledge. Hello, you're a scientist. Okay, so what do I mean when I tell people you don't need to be an artist? When we start engaging drawing what we see in the sky, I think there's two real purposes here. First of all, when we draw something, we tend to remember it. If we draw the Big Dipper, we remember the shape, we'll recognize it next time. If we draw the circumpolar constellations, we're gonna recognize them next time. Even though they continue to tilt throughout the night and throughout the year, they rotate around the North Pole, we're gonna recognize that pattern. So there's a, there's a learning aspect to it. The other aspect to it is to take ownership. Really the sky, legitimately truly does belong to all of us. And when we go out and we draw what we see and we catalog it, it's not art, it's data. We are scientists, we are astronomers, and we're gathering information, we're putting it down in a permanent way that we can save and we can say, oh, on you know July the 19th in 2021, I saw this. It was in my backyard and it was amazing for this reasons. And it helps 
it helps us because when we draw and we record and we write things down, when we come back later, it's not just what we drew. It brings back an entire memory of what happened. I looked at some sketches that I made uh, the other day of Jupiter in 1992 when the Shoemaker-Levy comet was impacting and where we were seeing the impact scars. And I looked at those sketches and I'm telling you, I, I remember what the crepe myrtle tree smelled like in my backyard. I could tell you uh, where I was and what telescope I was using. And it was, it was an incredible experience. It brought all of that flooding back to me. You know, what, 1990, what are we talking? 30 some, almost 30 years ago which seems nuts. It seems like yesterday because, and there, how many other nights have I been out observing with or without people and I don't have those drawings and I don't, the, the memory isn't as rich. It isn't as, uh, it isn't as contextual. It doesn't have the textures and the smells and I, I forget who was there, but with drawings, with sketches, it brings a lot more back to me. So right. in part, it's about, it's about putting down my history and saying, I, a scientist, did this on this day. And so today we're gonna to take a look at that. And we're going to, if we have time, we're gonna try two ways. And the first way is just gonna be a plain old sketch. And uh, I just uh, prepared an activity for the new book about sketching the circumpolar constellations. And uh, maybe we'll do that as a how do you know activity. I think that would be great. It's about the right time of year for it. Uh, because if we go out right now, we've got all the circumpolar, the major circumpolar constellations are about as high as they get right at sunset. You've got Ursa Major, you've got Draco, you've got Ursa Minor, you've got Cassiopeia, you've got Cepheus, and they're all there. Uh, other things rise later in the sky, Andromeda and Perseus and Pegasus and all those things. But the circumpolar, the really tight cluster of there's actually six Camelopardus is in there, but it's so darn faint. It's a real, real bugger to try to see, even unless you have really good skies. Um, so we're going to talk about uh, some drawing today. And what I'm going to start us with, Scott, is I'm going to start us out with Cassiopeia. Uh, I'm going to see if I can switch a camera. We're going to work uh, off the other okay. camera. So mm -hmm. we're going to see my hands today. And uh, what we're looking at here, we've got, this is a sketch that I made of Cassiopeia. And looking at this and you say, okay, can you draw that? One of the interesting things that I found asking people to draw and say, you look in the sky and you take your laser pointer and you say, oh, here it goes. It's shaped like a big W or a big M depending on where it is in the sky. Mm -hmm. And you go, there you go. And you go, draw that for me. And people immediately stop and they go, but wait, there's so many stars. I couldn't possibly get that all down. And so it's part of classic teaching technique. And you think about it, it's the way we teach anyone to do anything is we break the task down into smaller bits. The first thing I tell people to do is take a look at the major stars in a constellation and find the brightest one. Some constellations that's harder to do, but Cassiopeia is really kind of nice and easy that way. It's this star right up at the top. And uh, <clears throat> this is Kaif. And I think I'm saying that right. It's an Arabic name, C-A-P-H. And when we look at this, and so what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at finding simple shapes among the bright stars. So if we take a look at this right here, these three bright stars, and we see, oh, I see, we've got pretty much an equilateral triangle. And you'd be surprised, Scott, doesn't matter what orientation we draw in. And no. I'm going to play some games here. And so I'm going to go ahead and draw this because of the way our camera angle is. I'm going to go ahead and draw this. So we're going to go ahead and we start. And I always start with small dots. And I'm hoping, I don't know if you can see that. It might be better if I'm using marker. It might show up a little better. So 
Is that showing up on video for everybody? I think we're right at Yeah. Yeah, seeing that, making sense? Okay, so we start out and we're saying, well, okay, we've got an equilateral triangle. I'm gonna change the scale a little bit here deliberately. So I'm gonna go ahead and, okay, if I've got two things, I can get an equilateral triangle and you notice I'm changing the orientation as I draw here. I'm not doing this to be tricky. I'm just showing you that this technique works no matter what. I'm not drawing like, connecting lines. You might just pull the paper down just a little bit. Just, just a little bit? Yeah. Okay. How about, uh, does that work That's a little better? better? That's way better. Yep. That's way better. Okay. So I've got, I've got an equilateral triangle. I'm looking at this equilateral triangle. You kind of have to realize when you're sketching the sky, first of all, it's moving the whole time. It's tilting to the west. That's one thing that's happening. The other thing that's happening is not only that, but the angles always stay the same. So if I look at my equilateral triangle here and I realize, okay, I can look at this coming across and I realize that I use a ruler here. If I look at connect the line between these two stars, I realize, oh, this next one, it's not on the same line. And if we look at the distances here, and can you put a ruler on the sky? People are going, you can't put a ruler on the sky, doc. Actually, you can. Actually, you <laughs> can. You can put a ruler on the sky. And so I'm seeing ah, this line, and I'm getting something that's a little bit offline, and it's a little bit shorter distance, and it's right here. And so I've got this one, and now I realize, oh, I need to make another isosceles triangle. This section is a little bit longer and so i'm coming down here and i've got cassiopeia now do you really have it well okay go ahead and try to i'm going to do it without a ruler because i'm going to i think that obscures things i'm going to go ahead and i'm going to draw connecting lines and you'll notice that i'm not uh touching one dot to another And why am I not doing that? I'm not doing that because I'm going to go through now and I'm going to account for magnitude. Magnitude, uh, <clears throat> I believe it was Hipparchus who developed the first magnitude scale. That sounds uh, right. 200, 250 BC, and that's, a, that's a quick off the hip. I have to look that up, but Hipparchus came up with a magnitude scale and he, visually organized the sky into six degrees of magnitude, where mag one was the brightest, mag six was the dimmest. I've never asked my students to do this. Six degrees of magnitude visually for someone who's just starting is a real monster task, but almost everybody can do small, medium, large. So I asked him, okay, take the brightest star and give it the largest dot, all right, and that's the largest star. And these next two, which are Rukba and Navi, almost as bright, so the dots are almost as big. And these two are about equal size, so I'm going to make them. And then the next two, not quite as big, but they are definitely bright stars. They definitely stand out from the background. And so now I have this, and if I go ahead and I change the orientation here, and I see from my drawing to my sketch, I've done pretty well. I've done pretty well. It's not that hard to do. Once we get the major stars here, Scott, then we can go ahead and we can say, ooh, let's fill in some of the minor stuff. And if we fill in some of the minor stuff, a lot of people say, oh, well, there's just too much detail. I can't do that. The trick is not to look at, and I get people who want to do this, right? They just want to take a pencil or a marker right. and make a and bunch of random a bunch of dots, dots out there. No, that's mm -hmm. not a map. You don't draw, you know, you don't draw a map of your state. I'll put C's in now. <laughs> no, uh, Los Angeles is in Southern California. It's not a random dot somewhere. Uh, and so when we start drawing this, what we start doing is looking in the area around the major stars, start looking in an area around a major star, 
and we start looking for patterns, usually two or three or four. Two gives us a line, three gives us a triangle, four gives us some kind of a rectangular shape. So if I look here and I go, oh, well, here's a pair and it's almost on the line out. So almost on the line out. And I see I've got a pair and one's a little brighter than the other. So we make one a little bigger. Oh, here's another pair and they're kind of at an angle to each other. So over here, so I've got a pair. And this one is very visually apparent. This star right here, this is very visually apparent when you look at Cassiopeia. And okay, that's pretty bright. It's not as bright as the other. And then I've got a conspicuous double, which is down here a little bit. And as I go, I keep going, oh, let's go around the middle star, which is Nabby. This is Nabby right here. And I realized, ah, here I have, trying to make these a little bigger and more obvious so people can see them at home. I've got, oh, there's a nice triangle here and another double. And I'm just working through and I'm looking for, oh, can I get patterns? Yes, oh, look, this makes a nice triangle pointing up in this direction. So I make a nice triangle and I realize that triangle points to another nice double. And gradually, Scott, I uh -huh. can work through. And as I do this, I can go, oh, I've got patterns of twos and threes. And oh, look, there's a little lonely one right up here. And when I look at these two things, they are not the same scale. Oh, I guess one was drawn on the other paper. They're not the same scale and they're not the same orientation or angle, but I can get accuracy simply by slowing down and breaking down this process into, oh, here's a large triangle of bright stars. Here's a, this is almost equilateral. This is isosceles, but much shallower. It's much more oblique. And then I start, and Cassiopeia is a really nice place to start because there's only five main stars. There's only five. And then from there, we make a pattern. Now, sometimes you can go ahead and you can make a pattern and you can go, well, all right. I can do something that's a little more fascinating. What I do for this exercise, I take a piece of paper and I fold it. And you folks in Europe can use A4 paper. We use eight and a half by 11 Xerox standard paper in the United States. And I'm looking at, ooh, here we go, the circumpolar constellations. And so I have first, second, third, fourth quadrant. And I start with Polaris. You realize, folks, how big this is? Scott, do you have any idea offhand how big this is in degrees, this pattern? In degrees? Yeah. Mm, I would say, just guessing maybe 40 degrees, something like that. This is 90 degrees wide. 90. And <laughs> 60 degrees high. It's enormous. Go. And yep. I, I often had people, and usually this question, God bless them, came from my, my administrators and my department chairs in schools and colleges. Well, can, can't you do... I've heard they have like this software that'll show you the sky. And can't you do this doc on, on a computer so the kids don't have to go outside? And well, no, we would do this. We would do this in school. And I, I had Stellarium. Uh, I'm sure everybody here is familiar with Stellarium, stellarium.org. It's a brilliant free planetarium sort of program. Uh, and it's open source and they have a whole community of people that keep adding cool stuff to it. But we would do this on Stellarium and put it up on a projector. And okay, it was a six foot wide projector. And I would tell people, okay, let's practice sketching it. Let's do it again. Let's do it again. Let's do it again. And I would really get them used to the patterns and the shapes and the distances and the orientations. And then we would go out. And uh, I think I've told you about this. My high school that I taught at had a football stadium built into a box canyon. So the walls were 100 meters on three sides. 
So it blocked out light. It was a lovely place to observe from. And they would go out and they would go, okay. And they were looking for something. They had been drawing it on a sheet of paper. They were looking for something that would be about twice the size of their palm held at arm's length. And I would get my green laser and go, no, the Big Dipper's over here and way over. And people would go, oh my God, it's so big. It's so huge. I didn't know it covered that much of the sky. They would always go out, Scott, after seeing maps. They were looking for little tiny asterisks, they could, asterisms they could cover with their thumb. And I people, see. Were, people were astounded when they saw how big the, how do I put that all on a piece of paper? Well, we've practiced it. So what did we do with this? We start with our Polaris. Shall I do this for you on a clean sheet? Maybe I sure. should. Maybe I should. Because people get the idea better if they see it from scratch. I will move this one off screen and I'm going to use it for a reference, but obviously I'm doing it. So I'm going to take my piece of paper and I'm just going to fold it in half twice. And basically I'm just making four quadrants. Yes, if you want to, you can go ahead and measure this out and draw lines with a pencil if you want to, it's fine. But now I've got four quadrants. So I'm going to start out with Ursa Minor. And I'm going to come up here about a quarter of the way up, and I'm going to give myself a dot. And I'm realizing, oh, Ursa Minor doesn't cover quite half a quadrant. It's a fairly narrow constellation. And so it arcs up, and we get one, two, three, and then we have the basket, which is, or the dipper, depends on who you talk to. But you've got this nice, and I'm going to go ahead, and I'm just going to Real quickly, okay. So we've got the little dipper. Once we've got that to scale, now we realize, oh, I remember we had this lovely thing where the, uh, the lip of the big dipper points to, points to Polaris. So there we go. I'm gonna come over here and I'm gonna go, okay, Here's the lip of the Big Dipper. And the Dipper is kind of open mouth, so it comes up like so. And then we've got one, two, three. And so we've got the Dipper's handle. And I'm sketching really quickly. But I'm looking over here. Oh, there's my Zara and Alcor. So I've got the Big Dipper. And I'm, I'm about as good at this now as our audience is, Scott, because okay. I'm, I'm doing this sideways. Right. And if you take a minute and you look and you go, oh, wow, you know that guide star that points to oh, yeah. the Big Dipper? The well, star. guess what? It also gives us the corner of the shoulder of Cepheus right about there. And ah, so we've got Cepheus, which comes up here, and then it comes up and it's kind of a elongated box. My students used to refer to Cepheus either as the doghouse or the ice cream cone, depending on what semester they were in. Uh. If they were in uh, fall semester, it was always the ice cream cone. And yes. if they were in spring semester, it would flip around. Oh, it's the doghouse, okay. So we've got Cepheus. If we've got Cepheus, well, the nifty thing about Cepheus is that Cepheus, if we look at this corner star in Cepheus, this takes us toward, if we split, and I'm kind of showing our audience here, if we split this, this takes us from Cepheus down to the two stars in Cassiopeia. And so Cassiopeia, the equilateral triangle is right here. And then of course we have the flattened triangle and the last one is a little farther away. Mm -hmm. And so there we are, we've got Cassiopeia and I'm trying to hold my paper down so I don't look uh, too sloppy here. And if we take a look at Cepheus, oh my gosh, pointer stars all over the sky, Scott. If we take these two stars in Cepheus, yep. well, guess what? They bring us up to the head of Draco. 
I always like to start Draco down here and I start with it uh, a little above and we kind of, sorry, we're coming out this way and then we go up and over and we have a couple across the top and then we're coming down and around and then we come up and here we hit the two bright stars and then uh, we get another little one off here. So Draco has this kind of snake's head sort of a looking thing. And then we come down and we realize, ah, oh, it wraps all the mm -hmm. way around. And so if we take a look, and obviously this is a quick two minute demonstration. Right. Uh, but I think our audience can see that this is something you can do on a clipboard by looking, oh, and what do you need? Pencil, ruler, paper, clipboard, you're good. Now, you'll ask, gee, am I satisfied with this as a map? No, I'm never satisfied. I'm often happy, but never really satisfied. <laughs> so when we look at this, and uh, I'm gonna go ahead and switch our video back again. So when we look at this sort of thing, Scott, and we've got this lovely little map and we go, oh, that's fine. And there we go, I've drawn it. Well, are we ever, oh, I, I messed it up. The Big Dipper is not quite the right shape. Everybody immediately starts to critique their work as soon as they're, they get done with it. What, sure. Da Vinci didn't sign the Mona Lisa for 20 years. He kept on fiddling what? with it because he wasn't quite, true? Oh, yes. No, he oh, did. Wow. He kept on fiddling with it for more than 20 years because he wasn't happy oh, with more it. More little. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, you can imagine this guy sitting here in front of this masterpiece and he's got to paint just a little more on the cheek, just a little bit of color. And you're like, Eddie. Uh, you know, Maestro, what are you doing? Uh, he wasn't happy. You know, compare this to people like Mozart who supposedly wrote complete symphonies in his head first and then put them down on paper without an error, without a correction, without anything. Um, you know what? That's that's one or two people in the history of humanity have been able to right. do that. Mozart, Newton, I'm not in that class, probably neither are you. If you are, I want to meet you and chat. <laughs> yeah. uh, but most of us take these maps that we make and we go, oh, okay, this is okay but I want more precision. I'm not really happy. I'm not sure the distances are correct, the proportions, the angles, da, 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 da. And so I had to think about a way to help my students gain more precision. And when I originally did this in my classes, I went back to who, of course, to Tycho Brahe, to Kepler, to Copernicus, and Galileo too, I'm sure. Uh, although he wasn't known for this kind of astronomy. And we went back and we looked at the quadrant. And we talked about this last, last time, Scott. We said, oh, well, if you have a standard ruler that's measured in centimeters and you hold it at arm's length, you've yeah. got one centimeter is, but I'm like, well, oh, that's, that's not quite good enough. So what I did is I found the plastic rulers, you know, with the hole in the middle and either end. So you can kind of, you could put them into a binder, you know, the kind of plastic rulers I'm talking right, about. I remember. Mm -hmm. Remember those? Okay. So sure. what we did is we went and got a dowel rod. We said, oh, okay, 60 centimeter dowel rod. And let's put some washers on at 57.2 centimeters. And we put the ruler through there and we got string and we went ahead and we cut the string so that it was 57.2 down to the end of the bow and back here. And so it bent the ruler into a portion of a circle. A 31 ruler, 30 centimeters. We had a 30 degree section of a, of a circle, which was nice because if we were outside, 30 degrees, and then you raise it up, 60, you go again, 90. So you've got this, uh, you've got, I guess, a 12th of a circle. <coughs> and we basically got this and we said, oh, okay, Hold it up with the stick up to your eye and, and look at the, uh, the ruler. And uh, I was always nervous about that because essentially I was telling people, okay, you know, put a stick up to your eye 
and look at a scale and you're doing it in the dark. And I never felt quite happy with that. And so I wanted a way, a simpler way to go ahead and have people make an instrument for themselves that would allow them to measure angles and distances precisely to map a constellation. And so what I came up with is something that I refer to as a pantograph. And uh, what I've got in my hand here, Scott, I don't know if you can see, but I've got washers, uh, a yep. bolt, a nut, a couple of washers and a lock washer. And I've got two rulers. Okay. Now, these are my metal drawing rulers. When I do this in class, I usually use wooden rulers and I'll tell you why. Okay. We want it so that when we put them together, we want to be able to see a centimeter scale on each side. What I normally do with a wooden ruler is we take a little file and we make notches every centimeter. But here on this ruler, I think you can see I've just taken a marker and I've made marks. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to do this on camera. Maybe I will switch cameras real quickly and it will help people see what I'm doing. Uh, let's switch that. So here we are on my desktop. And so I'm going to put a washer and a bolt. And then uh, I'm going to want to make sure I'm doing this correctly. I am. OK, I've got the marks on both sides, centimeters. And then I'm going to put a, another washer. And this is a, what they call a split ring lock washer. I'm not sure if you can see that. Um, mm -hmm. What works really well is a uh, one of these nylon lock washers that they sell at home improvement stores where it has the little nylon gadget in it. Oh, and, so it can't uh, uh, back out by itself. So it can't right? back out. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use uh, a couple of wrenches and I'm hoping I'm doing this correctly. And let's see. I do this question. There we go. I'm going to tighten this up a bit. The nice right. thing is with a uh, with a nylon lock washer, you only have to do this once. And so what I've got now is I've got my two rulers, and I can look through them. Now, what I do with this for measuring and mapping constellations, and again, I'm going to use this one that I've done. What I'm doing, Scott, is I'm holding this at arm's length. All right. And it works really well if I have a partner. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to adjust the ruler so that what ah, I'm seeing. I see. OK. So what I'm seeing here is I have one star is down at the vertex. And my other two stars lie along mm -hmm. the scale. Mm -hmm. And I'm looking at this and I'm going, well, how many centimeters am I up here? Let's see, that's two, four, six and a half. And on this side, we have two, four, six, seven. And so now I can put this on a piece of paper and I can go, well, I had one at the vertex right Brilliant. here and I had two, four, six and a half right here and then i had two let me two four six seven right here and now when i go ahead and i make my when i enlarge my dots so they're more visible i now have the precise angle hmm. and pattern once i've got my first three what i'm going to do then scott is I'm going to use the last two are measured and I'm going to add one more. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to open this up here and I'm going to measure my next star is two, four out. All right. And so I can go onto my paper and I can go, well, I need two, four out. So I'm right here and then I can go ahead, the last two, add one more. 
And so here I change the angle and I don't even have to measure these two, just the last one. And I'm getting two, four, six and a half. Mm -hmm. And so once again, I put it down here and I go, okay, here we go. Two, four, six and a half gets me to right there. Mm -hmm. And so there I go. And so I look at this and I have a very precise map. And the nice thing about this gadget is that the angles are exactly as I've measured them as in the sky and the distances are exactly as I measured them in the sky. Excellent. And since the angles and distances, if any of your audience are uh, math or physics trained, they know we're now looking at vectors. And so what we've got, Scott, is a vector map of the sky. Very cool. Very cool. Now I have a question, uh, Daniel. Sure. Was this was this a similar method employed by people like um, Hipparchus or uh, you know uh, Bayer or any of these other guys that that made star maps? I know um, Bayer comes later. He's in the telescopic era. Yeah, and I believe what Bayer was doing is he was using uh, a German equatorial mount, what a Fraunhofer mount. Okay. Uh, the fellow who invented it was Fraunhofer, which yep. is why we call it a German equatorial or a gem. Uh, why do they call it a gem? It's a it's a German invention. And so he was using this and he was pointing his telescope. He had a reticle in his eyepiece and he's reading the angles and positions off of his setting circles. I see. Now you go back to pre-telescopic folks, uh, and I believe Bayer's in the 1860s, 70s. Mm -hmm. I'm shooting from the hip here again. Maybe you want to Google him up. But uh, I know Tycho is pre-telescopic and he was making large quadrants out of wood and he was making these reinforced frames and he would very precisely measure the radius and plane and shape the wood so he had a perfect radius and then he would divide off and he would have angles. He had some very large instruments, Scott, at his observatory then we're talking tico now yeah on the island of veen uh and that's a uh it was a danish island at the time i'm not sure i think it's the possession has passed since then somebody else owns it now but he was given to him uh by the king of denmark as a personal possession not only gave him the island he gave him all the people and the people were told you're now indentured to tico and so they were required to labor to build his observatory instead of planting their crops and tending to their sheep and livestock. They were not happy with Tico. <laughs> they were not happy. Um, when yeah. he left, they burned the observatory. Ooh, yeah. Yeah. Um, he's the guy that got like a chunk of his nose cut He's out. the guy with the silver you know, nose. Fight or something. Right. Uh, and uh, he died at a party given by uh, Frederick of Austria, it was impolite at the time to get up from the table unless the king did. The king was a much bigger drinker than Tico was, and he died oh. of a burst bladder. Wow. Yeah. I mean, he, bad. He lived He lived the life of a madman. He truly did. <laughs> and uh, what we're talking about here, Scott, with these, uh, with these crazy guys, Tico built these instruments, and at Uranaborg, he took the time to precisely align his observatory, not to magnetic north, but to uh, celestial north. Hmm. And he built his quadrant into the wall of his building. So he would wow. go outside and we're talking about uh, a 30 or 40 foot quadrant. So he would have assistants who would be climbing up on ladders and holding little pegs with a candle and raise it slowly, slowly there, read me off the number. And uh, he would record positions that way. And as you know, Tycho's maps were brilliant. They were not exceeded for a couple hundred years in terms of their accuracy. Yeah, 
apparently and, apparently it was Bayer that really did the big improvement. I'm sure. It says that yeah. Bayer's depiction of the sky included more than previous charts. He used a foundation of 1,005 1, stars by, by Tico, uh, right. who was commended for his accurate and comprehensive astronomical documentations. And he, right. yep. And so it was Bayer that added an additional thousand stars he had charted on his own. Right. Uh, and that's where the Bayer designation of brightness comes from and right. all of this. So. And you realize with, with Tico, what he's doing, Scott, he's looking down the side of a building, right? So he only gets the position of the star when it crosses the meridian. Okay. Right? He cannot, he cannot get it accurately. It's not against the scale if it drifts too far west. And if it's too far east, it's around the corner of the building. He can't see it. Hmm. So he sits there and you can imagine him putting his head out. Okay, it's getting close. Okay, it's getting close. Get ready. And then the assistant would raise her lower because this thing is 30 feet away. He can't do it by himself. Right. Uh, and it's much the same thing with our, with our pantograph activity. And if you look up pantograph, Scott, uh, pantograph is this thing that was uh, kind of scissor shaped and it was used in old newsrooms. You would put a pencil in one end and then a pencil on a hole in the other end and okay. you would trace the drawing and it would oh, copy it out. It would copy it out in scale. Yeah, so yeah, if you yeah. wanted to take a big sketch and make it smaller for the newspaper, that's how they did that. And uh, my old uh, college town in Illinois, Bloomington Normal, uh, they actually had a newspaper called the Bloomington Pantograph. That was the name of the local paper. I see. Which was lots of fun. And with these, with these maps, Scott, if you're looking, you can actually hold it at arm's length and go, okay, I'm sighting through here. I'm looking through and I'm raising my finger. I've got one star, I've got the other star. Okay. And now you can hold this and then put it down on paper and have your partner mark before you let go. Uh, with the notches on the wooden rulers, uh, I would put notches and I would paint luminous paint in the notches. And so it was kind of easy to see, okay, I'm two, four, six, eight up, I'm 15 up here. And then I would transfer and it was easier to do. Mm. The notches made things lovely. The notches made things brilliant. And uh, I, I loved working with the notches and uh, uh, that made things really, really nice. Um, because with the notches, I could go ahead and um, actually do this activity individually. Although it always, I've always found, everybody has told me it works better with a partner. Uh, but the really nice thing is that we can go out and we can start to really know the stars and the constellations a little bit more intimately. Hmm. A lot of us go, okay, well, especially those of us who use go-to systems, and I'm not sneering at go-to, uh, okay, I, I wanna see the double cluster in Cassiopeia and we enter the coordinates and the telescope slews <laughs> and we kind of lose some of that intimacy with the sky. With this kind of star mapping, and once you've got your basic vector map, you do the same thing. You sit down, you go, oh, now I'm going to take some time and actually focus on one constellation and start sketching and mapping in some of the fainter objects. There's a great temptation to use a pair of binoculars with this, but I don't recommend it. Uh, if you do use binoculars, you want to use the lowest power you can find. Because as you know, you put a 10 by 50 up to your eye, you're going to see what? 50, 75, 100 oh. times more stars. Right. And easy. it's so easy to get lost. <clears throat> One person, two people in Times Square, you can find them. New York, you know, uh, New Year's Day, not so much. Right. right? It's just, it just... You see Many. all this stuff, and the more power you get, the narrower your field of, field of view. So if you want to try this with binoculars, you want something like a 7 by 35 would work really well. Mm. You want as low a power as you can get. Uh, I just got a pair of uh, 2.5 by 56. There you go. Yeah, those are made by Vixen. Is that right? Uh, I believe they are. Mine were branded by another company, but I believe they're Vixen made. Yeah. 
and uh, they're specially designed and uh, they're super wide angle and they give you kind of like owl vision. It's, it's great. It's like your own vision, but more. And uh, yeah. so they're, they're a lovely product, especially if you want to get really familiar and do some mapping. But I'm hoping everybody will, uh, will maybe uh, go out and try this. <laughs> if you've got some clear skies and if you uh, want to take a picture of your map and send it to me at astronomyforeducators at gmail.com, I'd love to have a look at them. Maybe we'll put some of them up next week. That would be cool. <laughs> and uh, for next week, uh, I think we will start to talk about uh, some of the motions and how we divide the sky because some fascinating things. And when we talk about how we divide the sky, well, how do you know where things are? And we haven't actually discussed coordinate systems at all yet. And it's one of those things that's so fundamental. People who know it don't think about it. Fish don't think about the water they swim in. And astronomers who are well experienced don't think about their coordinate systems or how many they use. Mm. And so next week, we're going to take a look at some uh, a deeper dive into some of the coordinate systems and where they come from, how we use them, and what kind of screwy uh, assumptions we carry forward. Astronomy is the most ancient science. And we find that when we talk about constellations, that's one of the very oldest ways of mapping the sky. Yes. Is by constellation. Mm -hmm. And we still do it 15,000 years after the system was invented. You think about what other things have we been doing for 15,000 years? We maybe domesticated dogs about that time and cattle. Uh, I think we started uh, switching from hunter gatherer to agricultural communities about that time. So you think about what have we been doing for 15,000 years? Uh, astronomy and agriculture, <laughs> animal husbandry. Um, there aren't a lot of, I don't think you could really realistically say medicine. It was back in the rub some dirt on it. You'll either walk it off or die kind of, kind of era. So we're going to look at uh, some coordinate systems next week and take a look at how we know where we are. Excellent. You know, the old joke, you pull into a gas station, ask directions. And the guy says, you're not from around here, are you, bub? Uh, well, how do you know? Well, no, I, I wouldn't be asking for directions otherwise. That's right. How do you know where we are, where you are? How do you know where things are in the sky? And what kind of, what kind of hidden underlying assumptions do we make when we set up coordinate systems? Hmm. So we're going to talk about that next week on how do you know? That's right. And if we have some questions and stuff today, I'd be happy to. Uh, yeah, there's there's those. some comments anyhow. Uh, okay. Let's see. Um, let's see. Book Davies, if you're really ambitious, get on the drawing table, dig out the T-square angles and compass charted contemplation, and start filling in details with the telescope, charting the old-fashioned way. Wow. Um, let's see. And I don't uh, have a T-square anymore, but no, <laughs> I used to. I used to have a, a T-square. You must be able uh, to still buy them, right? I mean, eBay. Oh yeah, I'm sure you can. Or, I used to have a T-square and I used to have a little, uh, little tabletop drawing. It was a thing with wire cables on it. So you could. Oh yeah. Drafting table. And, drafting yeah, table. It was a drafting table. It was a little tabletop one. Sure. Uh, that would fit. Everybody needs room. one. On my desk. <laughs> it's yeah, make... absolutely I do. Well, it's, it's just another way to, to do this. Uh, Billy Beckett says, Dr. Barth, you're making my astronomy fun. Thank you so much. So well, happy to hear that. I appreciate those comments greatly. Yeah. All right. Well, um, uh, I will uh, uh, start to wrap up this program with you, Daniel. But I do want to remind everybody that tomorrow is the 55th Global Star Party. And it's going to happen on July 20th. And what is that? That is the anniversary of the Apollo, Apollo. 11 landing on the moon. It also happens to be a Viking landing uh, moment on Mars as well. And um, it happens to be uh, the birthday of one of our special speakers that will be on, the senior astronomer of the of SETI. You know the guys that do the search for extraterrestrial oh intelligence. Those what guys. A cool birthday. Okay, to but have. the real science guys that do this. 
uh, Dr. Seth Shostak. It's his birthday, uh, but he's going to come on to our program, onto the Global Star Party tomorrow night. He'll be on uh, fairly early. Now, I also want to tell you, we're going to move Global Star Party from the normal 8 o'clock central time to the 7 o'clock central time, okay, because we're getting later into the year, and we can start to do that, um, and people won't have to be up so late as we do our presentations, but it's going to be a lot of fun, um, and uh, we hope that you join us. This whole program, the special guest host is Caitlin Ahrens, Dr. Caitlin Ahrens from Goddard Space Flight Center, so she's going to have some very special people on. We're going to be talking about the moon, uh, and I think you're going to really enjoy it, so... Until uh, until tomorrow, uh, you guys keep looking up. We also have um, uh, the Open Go To community uh, where uh, you know we have Jerry Hubble uh, talking about how to measure the sky. So uh, this kind of goes along with all of this. So it's like we're gonna you know you got Dr. Barth teaching you how to make star maps. You got uh, uh, Jerry showing you how to. Um, uh, understand spectroscopy and photometry and all of this stuff. So we hope that you're getting, it's like you're almost like in a little mini university here. So, um, which is, which is fantastic. Um, we loved having you guys uh, watch the program today. Daniel, I'm uh, really happy that uh, you do this whole program. Uh, and um, uh, we look more uh, forward to more of your uh, special shows. Until tomorrow, you guys take care and we will see you. Take care. Bye bye, everybody. Bye Thank bye. you. Bye bye.